extension forester. Sorry, I don't know your oh, name. Oh, no, that's so fine. I'll let, go, I'll let go introduce you. So. Oh, yeah. Also, if you guys have any speaker suggestions or think of some good people to have speak, let us know that too. So either Ryan, Kelly, or you can let me know too, and I can get to them too. So um, the quicker you get that out, our summer meeting, maybe we could get that already situated and stuff like that. So thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good to see you. Uh, I know most of you. You know most of you know me. Joe Zalesnik, Extension Forester, NDSU. Uh, we're here today to give you an update on a couple projects we got going on. Uh, one is the use of shelter belts by honeybees, early season production. And Haley Keene is the student working on that project. She's going to go first, and then I'm going to talk about our arboretum project. And with that, and there's not a whole lot of intro here. I'm just going to hand it over to Haley. Yeah. Is this a clicker? Oh. Okay. Sure. Well, thanks for that intro. Um, so I'm Haley. I am a master's student at NDSU and just talking about some project updates since um, Joe presented on this last year. And um, some things that we found in the last year um, with our honeybee and shelter belt project. So just a little background, you guys probably know a lot about shelter belts already, but um, they were planted for a variety of reasons. And we've got um, some highlighted on the right, a little hard to see, but you can see that there's a lot of shapes and sizes that are different. Um, so you know that they're a lot, they're very variable um, and there's a lot of different species in them. And there are a bunch of uses for wildlife, so we can, they use them for protection and food and foraging, reproductive habitat and corridors. And then um, we know that they're spring flowering. So in um, April through June, they're um, flowering throughout the landscape. And so we want to know if the shelter belts are used by pollinators as well. Um, so the spring flowering coincides with a few different things like pollinator emergence, and um, completion of yearly migrations. But what we're focused on is when the beekeepers are bringing the honeybees back to the region. So um, beekeepers in North Dakota bring honeybees back to the region in like May. So um, they could be using these shelter belts um, in that time. So our questions um, for this project are, um, we want to know if honeybee colonies are um, corresponding with the shelter belt cover across varying spatial scales, and then also what species of pollen are um, they're using from the trees and shrubs. So I'm going to be focusing on the second objective for this presentation and looking at some of our pollen results from 2020. So in 2020, we had two different regions. We had 24 sites, and you can see we had a central region on the right and then a western region on the left. And in the central region, we had nine different sites, and in the western region, we had 15 sites. And then last year, we transitioned, oops, and we only focused on our western region. Um, so we expanded that region, and um, now, instead of just being in Adams County, it's in the surrounding counties, and then also into South Dakota. And we had 27 total sites over there. And then in 2022, we have one more field season, and um, we're hoping to use similar sites that we did in 2021 with that expanded Western region. So you can see on the bottom, that's a, uh, an example of an apiary. Um, there's a bunch of different colonies or stacks of bees. And then on the top left, um, if you pictured the site in the middle, um, you can see that there might be a lot of different trees around, all highlighted in the pink. Um, so we go out there and we check to see if they're flowering every week um, and what kind of species are around there. And then we also visit four different colonies at each of our sites every week. So on the left, you can see that there's a hive scale. 
and that's measuring um, weights every hour. Um, and that's kind of getting a sense of like how much honey is being produced. And um, so we're comparing um, the sites, their hive scale data to see if um, the ones that were closer to trees uh, were gaining more weight throughout the season. And then we also use these pollen traps. So there's two of those at each of the sites and the bees are entering in those holes and then the pollen is being dropped off in the drawer. And this is kind of an example of what one of the pollen samples looks like. Um, so it's a little hard to see, but um, there's a bunch of different colors with different species. Um, and then we send that off to a lab and so we can see what species the honeybees were actually using. So looking at some of our results, um, this is just some of the data from what species were surrounding each of the sites. Um, so you can see the ones that are in bolded are more common on the landscape. So like caragana and um, ash and elm. And then this is uh, some of our pollen data. So for the next few slides, I'm going to be talking about what they actually did use. Um, and what we found in their pollen. So I have it split up by our two different regions, um, the western on the left and the central on the right. And um, this is just a total amount of pollen uh, from each of the families of the, of the species. So um, I also have them broken up. The ones in the blue are uh, families that have trees and shrubs that were in the pollen. And then the ones in the yellow um, did not have any trees or shrubs. So um, I'm going to go further into this in the, in the next few slides, but you can see that like Favaceae and Brassicaceae um, with sweet clover and the cabbage and mustards, those were both the top two families that were used by the honeybees in the early season. And this is kind of a total of the pollen um, from each of the families from like May to um, the end of June or early July. So now I've broken it down by um, each of the weeks that we collected samples. And um, we're just going to look at the western region for now. So at the bottom, you can see um, starting in mid-May, which is right when the honeybees return to the region, and then ending at the end of June. Um, so the top families that were in our pollen in the western region were Fabaceae with um, a lot of sweet clover, which is kind of what we would assume. And then Brassicaceae um, and then Asteraceae with uh, dandelions. So th that's kind of what we would assume. We didn't see any shelter belt species in the top three, um, which makes sense. But then next we had lilac and ash was the fourth most um, used uh, family. And then uh, Poaceae with grasses. So sorry, I forgot to explain this, but the darker color just means that um, there's more pollen from that family. And then next, going into some of the shelter belt families that we actually found. So like I said, Oleaceae was one of the top um, shelter belt families that was found in the western region. And then we had Pinaceae with pines and uh, spruces. And then Capri Foliaceae, which includes the honeysuckles. And then Sapindaceae with maples and um, that would also include uh, like box elder. And then Ramnaceae with uh, buckthorn. And Rosaceae includes a few different species, such as um, choke cherries and plums. So you can see that there was quite a few shelter belt species um, used in our Western early season pollen. And um, they're in lesser quantities than um, some of the other families but they were included. And then now switching over to our central region. Um, so going back to those top early season species, we again saw Fabaceae with the sweet clovers. And then um, this time though, it did include Caragana, which is one of the shrubs that's really common on the landscape. Um, the 
this pollen though was um, mostly sweet clover, so it only included a little bit of carragana. And then um, we also had the brassicaceae again. And then um, in the central region, we did see a really high use of willows, so the Salicaceae family. As you can see on the bottom, it's still really dark compared to um, a lot of the other families. So um, the top, the third top family um, includes the willows. And then again, the dandelions. And then again, the lilac and ash was um, really highly used in the central region for the honeybees. And then now going through all of the shelter belt families that were used in the central region, um, we again had a little bit of caragana used and then a bunch of willows, a bunch of lilac and ash. And then in this region, we had much more rosaceae used. So a lot of choke cherries, apples and plums. And then again, buckthorn. And then in this region, we also did have Russian olive and buffalo berry. Um, and then honeysuckle and snowberry, oops, maples, and then hackberry. So comparing these again, you can see that lilac and ash was well used by um, the honeybees in both regions. And then we also had um, the willows also used. And then you can see there's a, a few more shelter belt um, species used in our central region, but it kind of makes sense with um, more species over there. Um, so just going through a few of these families, like I already said, um, we only found caragana in really low amounts and only in our central region. Um, that's kind of surprising because caragana is really widespread on the landscape. So we were thinking um, it could potentially be a nectar source for them and not um, a pollen source. So we're going to look into that in the future um, just to see if they are still using the caraganas, but just not for the pollen. Next, um, we did see a lot of willow use, but only in the central region. They're not really available in the western region, so that makes much more sense. And then lilacs and ash were used in both regions, um, and it was mostly lilacs, but there was some ash use. And then um, rosaceae was more used in the central region, but still used in both regions. So um, that's important to note. And then I did say that there was a lot of pinaceae or the pines and spruces in our Western region. Um, we think that that might just be from resin. When we send it off to the lab, um, they're you know looking at the DNA and stuff. So if it wasn't um, pollen, they wouldn't be able to tell that. Um, so that's something we're going to look into in the future. And it just kind of has to do with how clean the samples are. We go through a process of cleaning them. Um, so those ones just might not have been perfectly clean. Um, the resin kind of looks very similar to pollen, so it's a little hard to tell. And then we did see buckthorn, um, which is not really commonly planted in the shelter belt, so that was kind of surprising. And then like I said, we only saw some of the Elia Ignaceae show up in the central region, um, which is surprising because that one, again, like Caragana, is widespread throughout um, all of the state. And um, we're also thinking that one might be used for nectar instead of pollen. So that's something we're going to look into in the future. Um, and then uh, Capri Foli ACA, we did see some honeysuckle, but a lot of that was western snowberry, which again is not really planted in the shelter belts. Um, so that was kind of a surprise, but it's also not, honeysuckle is not like super, super common either. So there was some use of it. And then lastly, um, we did have some maple use, and we're not really sure what species that was yet. Um, because it only got us down to the Acer genus. So um, that's something we're gonna keep looking into in the future. And then lastly, um, for our conclusions, 
Um, we did see um, the Fabaceae, Brassicaceae, Asteraceae, and Oleaceae families consistently highly used in both of our regions. Um, so the Oleaceae was one of the um, families with some trees in it. So that's kind of cool to find, but those other three um, we kind of just expected to see in high amounts. And in total, we found uh, nine shelter belt families used by honeybees. Um, and the ones that I really wanna point out are the willows, the lilac, and then the rosaceae family. So the willows were used in the central region, the lilac in both re regions, and rosaceae again in the central region. So those ones might be something we wanna consider in future plantings. Um, this again is only our first year of uh, field work. This is all from 2020. Um, it takes quite a while to get our results back. So um, we still have uh, our pollen from 2021 to send off in our pollen from 2022. So we have a lot left to find um, with these results, but these are just some of our pre preliminary results. So like I said, um, we still have a lot left to do um, we have our last field season. We still, I haven't even um, touched much of our hive scale data. So that's um, something that we're gonna look into. We're gonna try and see if um, the scales and the hives that were closer to more amounts of trees, um, if they are gaining weight faster than any of the other ones that have less trees nearby. And then, um, we also have more to look at with our vegetation survey data. I kind of just showed um, presence absence and what was available there, but um, we're gonna look at when things were flowering and really um, tie that into what we found with our pollen. So lastly, I just want to thank a few um, people and our funding source um, with North Central SARE and then our beekeepers, um, the Hedinger Research Extension Center and then various technicians. Um, and then if anyone has questions, you can email me or ask them now. I don't know. Yeah. So I guess we have time for, for one question now, but we'll be here. Any questions for Haley? Yeah. So when you guys are planning to look at floral source and nectar going forward, yep. can you do any of that so far? No, so our pollen traps, um, it just brushes the pollen off and we collect it in, in the drawer and send that off. So we haven't um, looked at all at nectar yet. Um, we're gonna go out and count kind of how many bees have pollen versus how many don't have pollen on um, some of these shelter belt species. And that'll kind of give a better sense of like our more is more, um, is there a higher percentage of them that are just going for pollen on the species or are there more bees on the, on the um, trees that don't have pollen, which would mean they might be going for nectar. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Uh, okay, yeah, I guess I got my